Welcome to Patients at Risk, a discussion of the dangers that patients face when physicians are replaced with non-physician practitioners. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Bernard, and I'm joined by my co-host and the co-author of our book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare, Dr. Nran Al-Ajba. Hi, good evening. There are, over, there are over 400 nurse practitioner schools in the United States, with nearly half of these programs promoting online learning, ranging from 50 to 100% of required academic training sessions. Some of these programs offer accelerated training, allowing students to become a nurse practitioner in as little as two years. Others offer flexible schedules with part-time programs, allowing students to work full-time while they attend school. For contrast, there are just 179 medical schools producing physicians in the United States. None of them are online and there are no part-time medical schools. Why has there been such a proliferation of nursing schools? And with such huge number and variability of program types, who is ensuring that these programs are producing qualified medical clinicians? To help, help us explore these issues, we are joined by Rain Toman, a registered nurse who left nurse practitioner school when she discovered serious problems in the educational standards. Rain, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. The first nurse practitioner school opened in 1965 at the University of Colorado, and it was designed to increase pediatric care to underserved populations. Nurse graduates of this first program were trained to perform well child exams, provide immunizations, and provide health education to patients. But within just a few years, the number of nurse practitioner programs had increased to 65, with programs training nurses to take on a more extended role beyond working as physician extenders. Nurse practitioner training has received huge funding from the federal government. The 2010 Affordable Care Act allocated millions of dollars to increase training programs. And an unintended consequence of this funding has been a massive increase in private for-profit training programs that fiercely compete for student tuition dollars, boasting 100% acceptance rates to potential students, offering flexible options, accelerated tracks, and some even promote direct entry that let non-nurses become a nurse practitioner without any previous nursing experience. Rain, you've had experience with some of these programs. Can you tell us about it? So I went back and it was a brand new program and it was, it was a local school. So, you know, I didn't think anything out of the ordinary, you know, when it was a brand new program. So, but I could tell like kind of right off the bat, it didn't, it just didn't feel right. And things just didn't seem right. Um, the, the way we were being instructed was kind of, it, we weren't learning. <laughs> we were just kind of going through motions, but we didn't really understand what we were doing, uh, especially in like health assessment. And so many of the classes were very easy, like our psychopathophysiology and um, psychopharmacology, which are like extremely important classes if you're gonna be a psychiatric nurse practitioner, because you need to understand those things. They were online open book, there were no lectures. Like there was no instruction for this. It was just, you're gonna take four exams, here's the dates for the test, there were 25 questions and they're not proctored. So all this, you know, I mean, there's no guidance here. So you're just kind of like quickly looking things up because you don't know what's, you're not being taught anything that, you know, if, if we're all going to, cause there's this, like, there's this idea that, oh, well, it's all self-taught. You hear that a lot with these nurse practitioners. Then why do we have school? Yeah. Like, and why I are you buying these so books, much, right? So much money. Yeah, why am I paying? Exactly. Like if I can just go buy these books and learn it on my own, why do we, what do we need these schools for? So, you know, that's kind of something they, it's just become a culture because that's how these schools are, but that, no, we all know that's not right. <laughs> like, so you, know, right, you, um, were, you were a nurse already in, in the psychiatry, correct? A registered nurse? Right. Program. Yeah. I'd worked medical too. Yeah. And how I many mean, years it, had you been a nurse before you started school? Well, five years. Five years. That. And how mm -hmm. did you select the school that you first started at? So it was a local school that had a master's program because our, uh, like my local university had a DNP and I mean, I just didn't see the why am I going to go into six figure debt? Because nobody's going to call me. I didn't know everybody was be, like trying to push to be called doctor. But back then my thought process was like, why am I going to pay for this? I'm not, nobody's going to call me doctor. I don't want to be called doctor. And this is, it's like, it was like, it's like $120,000 at a state school. Wow. And there's no clinical, you know, it's not like you, there's more clinical knowledge to it. It's, it's a lot of papers. Cause I actually did start it, start at that school in 2015 and I started in one class and I was like, why am I doing this? And my friend was in it too. And we, I dropped the class and was like, I'm not doing this. This is like, this is not, 
this is not nursing. This is like, I don't even know what this is. This is not going to prepare me for psych. And so I was like, eh, I don't want a DMP. This doesn't make sense. So you picked a school that was in the right location, was convenient for, for you. And, and of course it, it was credentialed. So you expect you're going to be getting adequate training. Well, and I got my bachelor's there too. So it wasn't like an unknown school to me. You know, it's a small right. local school. So, I mean, that makes perfect yeah. sense. And so right. once you get started, then you start seeing some pretty serious problems and you start reporting these problems to the proper authorities. Tell us about that. Right. So the, you know, because there are a lot of issues. I mean, they were giving secret exams for people that failed like health assessment and, you know, it was just insane. So all this kind of cult, like, the straw that broke the camel's back was they were, they didn't set up my contract with, but they sent me to clinical. They told me I could go there. And so I went and then HR called and said, you can't be here. Okay. So then I found out per my New York state regulations, you can't even do clinical hours with a physician's assistant. And I was kind of like, okay, they either, they either know and they're just letting us do this or they don't know. And they probably should know. Anyways, I'm kind of done. So I actually consulted with an attorney who said, well, you know, report them and, you know, see where that goes. So I report them to the accrediting, accrediting agency. I mean, it's a 25 page complaint. There's like with all the evidence, you know, cause you, cause the other thing is the CCNE makes it, they're very, they want, the complaint has to be a certain way. You have to find in the standards what's being violated and put it exactly how they, they make it difficult. I think so people don't complain. I mean, let's be honest. You also can't be anonymous. So students don't, now you've got retaliation. So I reported to them and I also reported to the state education department and the CCNE said there were no issues whatsoever. And as of right now, I mean, the department of education told me that per many phone calls, which I have not talked to them since January of last year, they've been in contact with the Dean to make sure everything's okay. That That's where we're at as of December 16th of 2020. So some of the things that you reported, I have them here. Uh, first of all, you're supposed to be prepared as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner to, to care for patients, quote, across the lifespan. Yes. So I'm guessing that means all ages. Yes. And so even yes. though supposedly you're supposed to be come out with competency, your program offered only one lecture on the care of children and adolescents, one lecture, and one lecture on the care of seniors or older adults and yes. provided no specific clinical hours in those populations. No, so they just say to be trained in that. That that was another like major point. They all they just say go do your clinical hours. And a lot of them they wanted you to do in psychotherapy because they actually didn't even have a psychiatric nurse practitioner running the program. They had a clinical nurse specialist who they had her when I started, and they haven't been able to keep a psych nurse practitioner as a director. They don't even have proper staff to run this, but don't ask me. I mean, I'm not in charge of all this, but um, they just tell you, go do your hours. And so people are graduating with no hours in child science, and especially in child and adolescent, because those hours are extremely hard to find. Other programs, because I did get into a better program, they say, you know, they give you, you got to do at least 100 hours. There's like set requirements. Um, but, and, but that in the pro other program, like if you really wanted to do child psych, you could do the majority of your hours in that, but you still needed to do them. You know, they kind of work with you. And your but hours is supposed to be 500 clinical hours altogether. That's the minimum. Um, the, the program that I was in that I reported it, I think it added up to like 540, I want to say. And of those they 500 have hours, you have to get 100 clinical hours with children to be certified to take care of mentally ill children. Well, that was the good program that, that had actual, <laughs> oh. the, the one I was in just said there were, there were 240 hours that was split up into three categories, three classes. The first was 120 and you had to go do 120 in a medical setting. And that's where everything like went downhill with me because I was doing it in an ER with a PA. And then you had to do 240 hours. And I believe those were in psychotherapy because the clinical nurse specialist set this up and she was really, you know, that that's what she does. She does psychotherapy. So it was really heavy on that. And then the 180 hours were supposed to be like med management, but they could be, they didn't have to be across the lifespan. You, you could go to a practice. They just say, go do the hours. Right. It's kind of like a free for all. It's just, it's so, I don't mean to laugh because it's not funny. It's actually extremely mm. upsetting and sad because children are the most vulnerable, some of the most vulnerable patients that are out there and caring for them when they're especially mental illness. I'm a family physician and th I can't even imagine taking on that responsibility. Naran, as a pediatrician, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, it's interesting. I just had a med student working with me and um, she just happens to be applying in emergency medicine and had done three years of med school. So she's in her fourth year. And she said she had no idea how much psych we do. And I would say it's probably... 25% of every pediatrician's work. But again, there's certain lines I won't cross. You know, there's certain medications. There's only one or two antidepressants I'm comfortable using. Um, you know, I will use risperidone, right. which is one antipsychotic. I won't use any of the others without psychiatric management help or someone who's a psychiatrist weighing in. And so it's interesting though, we do have two um, psychiatric nurse practitioners in our town and one is really knowledgeable, really experienced and really good. And one just loves lithium and every kid's on lithium. Mm. And yeah. it's fascinating to me, such a spectrum. And I think that's what I'm learning from Rain that it, it depends on your program. Well, Rain right. complained right. Uh, about the hours, but she also reported to the accrediting organization that the courses that she was being taught, that all the students were taught on psychopath pathophysiology, which is the study of the causes of psychiatric disorders and psychopharmacology, the study of medicines used to treat psychiatric disorders were online. There was no lecture material or slides. She says there was no instruction, no discussion boards. Basically, you had to look it up yourself in a textbook. Yeah, there was no, you weren't being taught. Like there were no lectures, there was no guidance. It was literally the syllabus just tells you there were no, yeah, they give you the four dates for the exams and you sit down at your computer and you do it. And, that's and then the exams great. are without proctors. You could work together with other students. You could look up information Good. in the books if you wanted to. Right. I mean, I don't know if people were doing like working together. I wasn't, but I'm, I'm come on. I mean, well, I mean, there's always going to be, if there's an opportunity there, someone may take it and that's not great. Of course. No, this is not, this is, I mean, I've not, this is not how any education I've ever had is. And then it's kind of like, what is going on? So, but, you know, here's the other thing. And I don't think people understand this. People, students don't want to complain about this because this is easy. Like you think like, oh, this is great. And I, you're getting A's. So there's this false sense of like, you know, things. But you don't. And then like when the reality sets in that now you're out and in clinicals, because I did start clinicals with a psychiatrist and I'm like looking at him and he's like talking to me and I'm like, I don't know what he's talking about. And I probably should, you know, I should have more of a foundation, but you didn't learn anything. And you, you have know, one insight to realize well, that was a problem, but unfortunately not everybody does. And that's why you decided I can't do this anymore. I'm not going to put patients at risk. No, no, because when the door closes and you're alone with them, how do you, I mean, I just don't feel comfortable faking, you know, because I mean, I've, the other thing is like, people are like, oh, just finish, just finish. You'll make so much money. That's why people stay because, you know, they're also deep into it, you know, in the debt. Okay. But how am I going to sleep at night? Like, what if I hurt somebody? Like, yeah. you know, what's interesting. I hear so often that uh, other just depending on the programs, people will say, we get a lot of applications to our office, both um, Nikki and I both, and she feels the same way, doesn't want to help um, do the clinicals with the diploma mills, you know, not the brick and mortar, right. more long drawn out schools. And, and you know, she says, it's amazing how little you realize what's out there when you first come out. And it's, it's, they just have a false sense of it. And it's this sort of idea of just finish it, you'll make this money. And I'll tell you what, from my mm -hmm. perspective, money is not the reason to do this profession. Um, I'm, I just, no matter who you are, I mean, I don't even care if you're a cardiac anesthesiologist making half a million dollars a year, um, the money would not be worth the stress, in my opinion, or the level of care that you'd have to provide if you don't have the training. And I'm, I'm fine being one of the lowest paid specialties. Uh, again, I, I know we work hard. I'm not suggesting we don't, but the money isn't, shouldn't be the motivator. You, because you don't really go into crazy. medicine to make money. If you want to make no. money, there are a lot easier paths to do mm -hmm. that. Uh, although yeah. people are trying to make money and not, not always doing things the right way because we really need to take care of patients. So Rain, you really are on a mission now. And that is to expose these programs because you tried taking things through the proper channels and it didn't get you anywhere. So what I wow. see you doing now, I think is really important, which is shedding light on what's going on. And, you know, sometimes we'll hear people say, well, that's just one person's experience, or I don't really believe that this is really happening. And so what you've started doing is posting online information and tell us about why you're doing that and how you're finding out about these uh, like cases that you've discovered. Well, so when my school, I had never been on these Facebook, these nurse practitioner Facebook groups, but um, when everything kind of got like 
everything started to go south with my school, I got on them and I was like, oh my gosh, this isn't just happening here. Like, what is going on? And you start talking to people all over the country and message, you know, and I mean, I have like all these friends, these nurse practitioner friends now all over the country after this, but you're like, what is going on? And, and they're having the same problems. They're reporting it too. They're sending complaints to the CCNE. You know, there's this movement to send all these complaints. Nothing happens. Like, Oh, but we're not supposed to talk about it outside of nursing. Well, what do you mean? We've got like serious problems here and the people in power are not doing anything about this. And why? And then you start realizing like, this is a lot of money. Like there's something going on here, you know, because there's, it's actively being quieted. Like ever just keep it in nursing. Well, nursing's not fixing itself. And this is like really harmful to society because at the end of the day, we're all human beings, right? Like I, you know, I, take my nurse hat off, I'm a person, like this affects us all. Like if we wind up in an emergency room or, you know, 10 years from now, this is not safe. Like who's protecting the people out there that don't know about this? Like we know about this so we can keep ourselves safe, but what about, like this is not okay. Like this is not something I feel comfortable, you know, just keeping and, you know, like talking amongst ourselves isn't working. Calling these people, emailing them, filing these complaints, it's, you guys have been doing it for years. So how yeah. did you exactly take matters into your own hands? I mean, what made you want to just start posting? I've seen a number of your posts, which are fantastic. Well, because there's a lot of people that deny this is happening. Like that's kind of how it started because you got people that are like, oh, that's not true. Oh, the schools. And it's like, hold on, please hold. Let me go get you like five things. Here you go here. Like there's ample evidence that this is going on. People post about it every single day between the schools or they don't know what they're doing. You know, cause there's a lot of people that want to say, and sometimes they genuinely don't know this is going on, which is fine. But then I think there's a lot that just want to kind of like, I don't know, almost keep brainwash it everybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, keep it, yeah. exactly. Keep it silent. Oh, that's not happening. Because, you know, if you say that over and over, people will just be like, okay, but you no, know, there's evidence. Here you go. Like, so that's kind of how it started. So Rain's been posting a lot of different screenshots, but um, she also posted some really interesting things, which is that there are some actions being taken against some of these schools. So Walden University, oh, tell us a little bit about Walden. They're kind of well known in this diploma mill world. Yeah, Walden seems to be like one of the, you know, when you think of diploma mill, everybody always wants to say Walden um, because they're online and, you know, you see the posts, people say it's easy. You can get in like pretty much the same day. Um, you know, it's, it just doesn't have a great reputation. Like people, are, you know, they post, I'm embarrassed I went there. Um, but now they're finally being investigated. Yeah, they're in trouble now. And what's interesting is that their, their trouble came when a, another company tried to buy them out. So they, they, they're supposed to be bought out by a private equity firm for 1.5 billion, b -b -b with a B, billion right. dollars. So when you talk wow. about money, that's a lot of money. So Walden is in the process of being bought. But in during that, I don't know if it was during some due diligence that was being done, there were some allegations made and there's an investigation that Walden officials made rep misrepresentations to the, the accreditor of the organization, the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education, and that they falsely advertised aspects of the degree to students, including the availability of clinical site placements required to complete the program. So Walden is definitely under investigation. And then another sort of online school is they lost their accreditation just this last year in November, uh, that's Lehman College. And they lost accreditation because their students were not passing the nurse practitioner exam at adequate levels. So there is some attention being paid, but it's very slow moving. And it's so, extreme. yeah. So, <laughs> Another one, I, I have some screenshots here and we're going to put these up on our YouTube video uh, so that people can see them and know that they're real. These are people speaking out. Right. There's a lot of people talking about other online programs like Regis and Maryville. Maryville. What I see written down is uh, people seem to think that Regis is reputable and someone else writes, I know it's not reputable and that's what I'm struggling with. Everyone says it doesn't matter, but like it does though, is what somebody's writing <laughs> to another person. And so what is, what is the dialogue that you're seeing here that people are talking about, about these schools? Well, it seems as if 
people are either like, oh, the, this is terrible, or people are like, oh, no, it's the greatest thing ever. And the people, you know, that I think are talking these schools up that it's the greatest thing ever, they have no other option. They know that this is the only place they can go. And they, I mean, because they'll defend it, like, like they, they will aggressively defend these schools that they're, you know, oh, it's not easy. But I think to the, this caliber of student, it probably is hard, you know, because there's no standards. They're letting anybody in. So they're probably letting people in that they couldn't get into another school where it actually, because they wouldn't, it wouldn't be accepted. So it, it probably is on some level challenging to that individual, but that doesn't mean they're going to be safe and competent once they get out. And some of those people are looking for the easier program. So I have a, a post here that says, I'm going back for my psych NP. Is there a school out there without proctored exams or camera monitored exams? I prefer open book, open notes exams. I graduated from Walden when they didn't proctor exams and I still did extremely well on the boards. Any recommendations? And then another one that's, I'm looking for the absolutely easiest online MSN to DNP program. And they say, my MSN is from a very rigorous and locally prestigious program. It was hell, but I really think I'm a better NP for it. With that said, I am too old and have too many responsibilities to do a program like that again. So there is a demand for some of this, you know, it's, it's bad programs, but also some people seeking those less qualified quality programs. So actually when I, in my program, so there were like six of us cause it was brand new when we, when I started and then probably a year later, everybody, people were flocking to it with no psych experience because guess what? Word got out how easy this is. And you can make a lot of money as a psych nurse practitioner. And I even had, this was, she was an old coworker of mine. I had to call her. Um, I was doing case management at the time and I had to call her and she said to me, she goes, oh yeah, they're all running to, she knew about this. She like told me, she's like, oh yeah, all the ER, uh, psych ER nurses, they're all getting it because you know, do you, and I'm like, I'm like, what? I'm like, oh my gosh, like other people know about this. Like other people are catching on, you know, like that are not even in the program, you yeah, know, and, and then you see it on the internet, like people, what's the easiest, fastest way I can do this? And there are some really easy and fast ways. I mean, that's, that's advertised. You see, you know, fastest online uh, master's degree or DNP. So it's, it pops up in my Facebook feed all the time. So right. it's really amazing the aggressive marketing that some of these companies have done. So one of the biggest challenges with these programs is not finding adequate preceptorship. And you mentioned that one of the problems with your program was that they had you working with a physician assistant when that wasn't even technically allowed as part of your hours, right? Right. Right. I, well, I mean, I didn't know that, you know, they, they right. were, the school was approving and letting us do this. So I don't think they knew what right. they should have known. And one of the things that you've posted a lot are uh, nurse practitioner students desperately seeking preceptors. And it's really sad when you look at these. I mean, what are your thoughts when you see all this volume of people looking for help? Well, I think too, that's like a motivating factor because when you see all these people that are, you know, fellow nurses, like, it's like, what are we doing to our own? Like, how is this okay? Like, this is not okay. You know, and I, and I have friends that are like, I had to get out of those groups because all you do is see the preceptor post because yeah, it's nonstop. Right. We get requests every single day. I mean, it's, and it's gotten now, it's like even three or more and they write us letters. They give us resumes. One of them, my actually, my dad took care of the person as a child. It, it just, and it tears at your heart. And, and I, we just, I'm on with the, with the um, residency program. So I have residents and Nikki only takes um, DN, a PNP candidates from her University of Washington, you know, pediatric nurse practitioner program. That's it. She's contracted with them and she's just going to work with them. So we kind of, both of us have what we'll do and we just, we turn them down, but I feel bad for them. There's so many that just say, I need 60 hours in peds. I need, you know, 30 more hours in peds to finish. And it, literally every day we're getting these requests now. Mm -hmm. and, and they're desperate. Like they're, yeah. like they'll do anything because, yes. and it's, 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 it's sad. Like, what do we talk about working? Actually, even some of the letters will say, I've been seeing patients um, at no charge for my family doc or whoever I've been with. I'm more than happy to do nursing work at no charge to you to come and precept. And I always think like, wow, this is, I mean, mm -hmm. 
desperate just, times, desperate measures. Yeah, I feel yeah. really bad for them. And I just, I, I don't want to take right. on a student or anyone unless if I can devote the time to do my job, which is teaching them clinical care. But it, it's sad to know that there are other people taking advantage out there. Um, and, and, and it's not just the online schools. I, you, ha, you posted one here that was a student from Yale. So Ivy League's here saying <sighs> looking for a preceptor in the Bay Area and uh, hoping to get 120 hours in primary care and peds. And so somebody said, I thought Yale would get you your preceptors. And they said, well, they, they do usually, but because of COVID they can't. And so they're asking, wow. they're encouraging us to look out of state for preceptors. So Can you imagine Yale. I mean, just to, just to think about that for a second, Yale nurse practitioner program is asking people to find their own preceptors. There's no standardization. There is a preceptor in my hometown. I know I've spoken about her frequently um, and has a PhD. So goes by a doctor and also actually refers to herself as a pediatrician. She's anti-vaccine and she has signed so many medical exemptions and it's legal in the state of Washington. That's almost every medical exemption in our community comes from that individual. And it's shocking to me uh, that this is allowed to go on and Yale, right? which used well, to mean something. So well, Rain, the other thing that you've been posting a lot is um, because the education is really lacking, what we're seeing is a lot of nurse practitioners going on Facebook and other social media sites to ask clinical questions. And that's something that you've been sharing a lot with to, I guess, try to show the public or other people the quality of education. Tell us about why you've been doing that. Because there's a lot of denial that this is going on, you know, or, oh, it's not, it's, no, this is bad. Like, this is really bad. This is every single day. This isn't like every once in a while. It's not looking, it's not like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's the whole haystack. Yeah. And it's happening like, so much that Sophia Thomas, the American Association of Nurse Practitioner President, actually wrote a, an article begging people not to go to social media to discuss clinical cases saying, you know, first of all, it's not really a good way to get information. There are, you know, valid resources where you can learn and not just asking people, hey, how do you diagnose this or that? And also be saying, you know, it doesn't really make us look very good because people are pointing out our deficiencies. Right. I mean, and that article is, that's at least a year old because I saw that when I was, I was still in school. And I remember seeing that and being like, wait a minute, this is, shouldn't she wonder why are they asking these questions? You know, that was, you know, I mean, I had a lot of light bulb moments. That was one of them when I saw that article. I'm like, um, what, what? Because, you know, I started noticing the clinical questions when I got in the groups too, because you look at some of these questions, you're like, how are you, you should be, as a registered nurse, you should know this. Some of these questions, you know, it's like, what is going on here? You feel like you're in the twilight zone. And it, it, it is crazy. And so we, we have some examples that you've posted and there was a person that posted, is research in theory a huge part of most NP programs? I'm going to a great school and their grads say they leave feeling prepared, but I'd really love to dig into some practical real world aspects of practice. And instead I'm doing a lot of research and theory assignments. And this seems to be the case for most NP programs. And so somebody else chimed in on the thread and said, yeah, it's definitely an issue. We had one two hour class on how to read an EKG, one. And, and also one two hour class on how to read a chest X-ray. But yet we spent an entire semester writing a 38 page thesis on something I'll never use. So are you, is that the kinds of posts that you're seeing a lot of people just really concerned about the deficiencies? Yes, I mean, yeah, there's constant, like, we don't want theory, why are we doing more theory? We should have more clinical, like have more, you know, science, medical. Um, and I do, I do want to contrast that with just as an example, you know, we get two minutes or two, sorry, two hours of, of class, let's say in our first two years of medical school on how to read an EKG. And what's interesting is I accumulated 40 hours reading EKGs only in my internal medicine rotation. And I would sit in the afternoons, you know, I was there for 12 weeks and I do about three hours a week, three and a half hours. And we would go through hundreds of EKGs and sign off on them. And I, I found it fascinating. I thought it would be really helpful in the future. And so that's just reading EKGs in adults, which I don't even do. I mean, I can read EKGs, you know, okay. I would say I'm okay, entry level. Um, with 40 hours reading adult EKGs as a pediatrician. So just to con contrast, I think that's what people miss. 
Yeah, we spent hours and hours and hours and hours learning EKGs. EKGs are very difficult. They're complicated. You can't just read the interpretation that the computer says and that's it. So if you don't know how to read an EKG, I mean, that's a really fundamental skill, but it takes a lot of time and certainly could not ever be learned in two hours. I mean, that's really egregious. I think one of the things that I found really interesting, Rain, that you posted was you shared some photographs of nursing projects that were done as part of like a final exam or a final project. Um, tell us about that and why you found that interesting. So I actually went to a um, the, the, the school I was at, they do like a, a the, you showcase your project. And I'm, if you look at the, you, the actual photos of them, I had, I went to it cause my friend was graduating sooner than I was. And I walked in and I was like, I felt like, I don't know, we were in like middle school and you basically stand by them and you kind of, like, you're like proud. And I'm like, what is going on? These are like, this is what we have to do. Cause I was kind of stressed out about this final project thing, you know, thinking it's going to be all this work. Oh my gosh. Like, what am I going to do? You know, cause this is, this should be a big deal. And you see these and you're like, what, this is all we have to do. I can do this in an afternoon. Like, yeah, they're just it? really, really basic. Like one of them is like an educational yeah. brochure on hand washing. One of them is taking care of a pick line at home, which is a, an, an intravenous line, a special type of one. And that's actually wouldn't even necessarily be nurse practitioner duty to me. It would be more of a nursing duty, right? Taking care of a pick line. Well, yeah, the, I mean, the, the ones we have examples of here, the, the, that's like nursing base. That's, that's like RN. Like I could see this for a BSN program. Okay, if this was your final project, awesome. But an MSN, because these were mostly MSN, I believe. And it's like, what? I mean, I don't know what we should be doing because again, I'm here to learn, but I'm pretty sure it should be like a lot harder than this. And there was one student, she spent two semesters on her. She actually did like a research project. She did like a phenomenal job. She stood there and like, she could explain it to me. And she said to me, she's like, don't do this. She's like, this was a waste of, she's like, she's like, don't waste your time doing all this work because it's pass fail. It's not even like she got an A and these other ones got, you know, a B, you know, so she, you know, and she's like standing there with this really like well put together research study she did, kind of feeling like, you know, an idiot because why did I spend all this time if I could have just, you know, done an educational brochure on hand hygiene? And well, we know that, I mean, if this is the expectation, then certainly it's not enough to give nurse practitioners the competencies that they're going to need to take care of patients. And in fact, a 2017 survey that was published in Worldviews Evidence-Based Nursing, they asked 2,300 nurses across 19 different health systems to assess their skills in 24 different practice competencies. And it was really sad because overall, the nurses reported that they did not feel competent in managing and meeting any of the indicators, including collecting data, communicating evidence, implementing change to improve care. And they found that nurses with a master's degree with a nurse practitioner level had higher scores than bachelors, but overwhelmingly, they still did not rate themselves as competent to practice evidence-based practice skills. So it's, that tells you everything you need to know right there that nurses are not assessing themselves as having the qualifications that they need and they know they need and the schools are the ones that are responsible for providing that. And I think Rain, you've done a really good job of showing that they're not meeting those qualifications. Well, they admit that they don't know. I mean, they post, oh, I don't, I don't know, you know, they. They're posting that. Like yeah, there's a lot of really sad and sketchy questions that come out. Like I've seen questions that say, how do I learn how to interpret labs? How do I learn how to um, just just really basic, you know, how do I learn how to figure out what a what how to treat colds? How do I figure out how to how to use different antibiotics? How do I know which antibiotics goes for what infection? Like you're going to Facebook and asking these questions. This is they are not taught that. I that part I will tell you. I it, they are simply not taught. They're not taught what the penicillin class treats. They're not taught about gram negative and gram positive. Um, they can't. They I, I just I've never seen anyone that can really delineate those different bacterial types really well, which is what we need in primary care. Absolutely. And Rain, you do a tremendous job of exposing kind of what's going on behind the scenes, which to me, I'm just, uh, you're one of my heroes because every day I get on Twitter and I look at what you're posting and I learn so much from you. So I, I want to just say oh. thank you for that because 
and it's really welcome. amazing. And we're going to learn a lot more. So we've just scratched the surface. And when we come back in our next episode of our discussion with Rain Toman, we're going to be talking about some of the uh, other challenges that are occurring in nurse practitioner training. We're going to explore the um, opportunizing of healthcare in which some uh, people are trying to use their education to pursue cash-based treatments that have maybe questionable value. There's a lot we're going to get into in our second part. So make sure that you don't miss any episodes. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, to learn more about this topic, I encourage you to get our book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare. It's available on Amazon and at Barnes and Noble. And if you're a physician and you're interested in learning more and joining us, please visit physiciansforpatientprotection.org. Thanks so much. And we'll see you on the next episode.